Jesus, you can't imagine the risk of God. Jesus said it. And if you took note of some of the dietary advice that I will give you, you would harm your cardiovascular risk. Now, I'm a simple doctor. I'm not a shaker and mover like people like you. So, although I can't do very much for India, I know you can. And my job is to keep you alive. Because by keeping you alive, I know you will make a difference for India. So my talk today is directed at the people in this room as opposed to people in India. So I'm going to give you an evidence-based talk. It's not just a talk I'm going to give up the top of my head. It's an evidence-based talk which tells you the four things that we ask people to avoid to re reduce their risk of cardiovascular disease is advice on smoking, advice on physical activity, advice on diet, and advice on how to cope with anxiety and depression. These are the four things that all of you need to be taking note of. I'm not going to talk about smoking cessation because that's obvious. The two things that are very, very obvious to us is that if you smoke, you increase your cardiovascular risk exponentially. If you don't exercise, you increase your risk. Now, exercise, lack of exercise, is the new smoking. Although legislation in this country has resulted in a massive reduction in people who smoke, uh, the number of people who don't exercise is quite high. So I am going to be talking to you about physical activity and diet. I will not mention the word aspirin, beta blockers, statins, or any tablets. These are the things that you can do every single day for yourselves. So let's start with physical activity. Now the benefits of exercise on the cardiovascular system are well established. People who exercise regularly are like, less likely to be obese. They are likely to have a better blood pressure profile and a better blood cholesterol profile. And through controlling all of these risk factors for coronary artery disease, People who exercise modestly reduce their cardiovascular risk by 50% when they're in their fifth and sixth decade. Okay? Here is data which comes from the UK. It's 70 years old, this data, where people looked at cardiac events in sedentary busmen um, in the red and active busmen in the blue. These are bus people that drove versus conductors who were going up and down stairs. And they looked at the same thing in postal workers. Clerks who were sat down doing very little, and postmen who were walking up and down delivering letters. And they found that people who exercised and were active reduced their risk of a heart attack by 50% in their fifth and sixth decade. 70 years later, there was another data set. So then, inactivity is your reference. So if people walked 30 minutes a day, they reduced their risk of cardiovascular disease by 18%. If they jogged slowly, I'm not saying very fast, jogged slowly for one hour a week, they reduced their cardiovascular risk by 42%. Outside cardiovascular disease, exercise has multiple benefits. Can you believe that exercise is actually anti-aging? Our DNA determines how we age and what happens in our bodies. Exercise helps us to repair our DNA as we get older. And people who exercise are less likely to get cancer of the prostate, cancer of the breast, <coughs> cancer of the uterus, and cancer of the colon. In fact, people who exercise regularly are more likely to be confident, have stamina to do what you guys do, less likely to suffer from anxiety and depression, and we now know that exercise retards the onset of dementia. Such are the benefits of exercise that if we packaged exercise into a pill, it would be the miracle pill. In fact, I can tell you now, there is nothing that we will invent in the next century, no matter how much money we put into it, that will rival the benefits of exercise. Okay? That's point number one. So these are all the benefits of exercise, starting from cardiovascular to anti-cancer effects to psychological benefits of exercise. Now the question really is how much exercise do you have to do to get these benefits? That's the, that's the question at the tip of your tongue. 
Well, in adults, we need to do 30 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity at least five days a week. Now, I don't mean join the gym as from today and start going on the treadmill and perspire profusely. I don't mean that. I mean walking from A to B, not getting the lift using stairs, not going from A to B if it's only a mile journey in a car when you can actually walk and the weather is satisfactory. I mean things like that. If you can only do 30 minutes of that, 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 that five times a week, or if you do something more vigorous, like going on a cross trainer or a treadmill or a rowing machine or a bike, you only need to do 25 minutes of that three times. Or oh, okay. clearly children, this doesn't apply to most people in this audience, uh, have to do twice as much of that. And our recommendations in Europe are that you should be doing at least <coughs> 150 minutes of exercise per week to get these benefits. So that's 30 minutes, five times per day. If you look lower down here, you see that if you're able to, we would like you to do a bit more than that. Maybe 300 minutes a week. So I would say that in a week you should be doing one hour of exercise every single day. Now, like you, I'm a very, very busy person, okay? And I am often stuck to the computer, or at work, working long hours, eating late, and all the things that <coughs> successful people and busy people do. But what I do every day without fail is to make sure I get at least five kilometers of walking. And you've all got a phone app, your iPhones. In your iPhones, you've got the Heart, Heart app. And that Heart app tells you you should be doing at least 10,000 steps every day. So what, you know, one of the goals that you should all have now is to make sure you achieve those 10,000 steps. Anything you do above, that's a bonus, but you should be doing those. Here is data from 55,000 individuals with a mean age of 44 years. So many people, many of you will relate to this. These are people who jog. So maybe a little bit more active than some people. In this data set, people who jog, if we follow them up over 15 years, they reduce their risk of all cause deaths by 30%. And they reduce their risk of cardiovascular deaths by 45%. Okay? So what did they have to do to get this benefit? In this graph, you see running distance at the top, running frequency, total amount of running, and running speed. Now, to get the benefits, they wanted you to do 6 to 12 miles a week. Not in a day, 6 to 12 miles a week. Divided over a frequency of 3 or 4. So you divide it over 3 or 4 days <coughs> at a speed of about 6 miles per hour. So I'm not saying really, really fast. Okay, but so this sort of exercise was twice what I am telling you to do. So twice the amount of exercise that we recommend. <coughs> How much exercise do you actually have to do to stop yourself getting diabetes, cancer, stroke, and heart attack? Here's a graph. At the bottom you see the reference. That's what we're telling you to do. Okay? But you see that the graph, the frequency of all of these things, ischemic stroke, diabetes, is going down if you do even more exercise. So if you want to get the maximal benefits, you need to be doing five times the current recommendations. Some exercise is better than no exercise. 30 minutes of walking five times a week is excellent. It reduces the risk by 20 or 30 percent. If you do more, you do even better. Just to remember that, okay? Look at this data set. On 661,000 people, look at their age, 62 years was their median age. We're not talking about really, really young people. It's never too late to start exercising. And what you see here on this graph is death rates relative to the amount of exercise that was being performed. If you did what I told you, these guys reduced their cardiovascular death risk by 20%. If they did five times that, they reduced it by 40%. So the take-home message at the moment is walk five times a week for 30 minutes. If you do more than that, that's even better. Okay? Clearly, if you are a jogger, you can do it in half the time. So you know now about smoking and increasing physical activity. I'd now like to talk about diet. Diet is very, very important. People tell you that you are what you eat. And some of you have heard some very controversial 
issues and comments about diet. You start eating one thing, and if you meet a friend who says, that's really bad for you. You start eating something different, and the medical fraternity tells you, ooh, that's bad for you now. We thought it was good for you, but now it's bad for you. But there's a problem with this, because studies on diet are very difficult. Diet is affected by several factors, including your genetic makeup, your culture, your socioeconomic status, and religion and all sorts of things. Large studies on diet are not practical. We can't be sure if we're doing a study whether the person's actually adhering to the diet, because you're relying on a questionnaire, which may not be entirely reliable. Long-term studies are very difficult to conduct. How long are you going to tell us a group of people in India to, keep, to stick to a certain diet before they stop complying with what you were saying. <coughs> and compliance is very difficult to monitor. You can't do a blood test to see if they're taking the diet or not. And there is no placebo. So you're not comparing something with something that's fake. Like when we give someone the tablets and when we're comparing its benefits, we give half people the real tablet and we give half people a fake tablet that does nothing to see if there's any difference. You can't do that in the diet. But diet has very important benefits. It improves your lipid profile. It's anti-inflammatory. It's anti-thrombotic, by that means it stops your platelets blocking up your arteries. It's anti-arrhythmic, by that I mean it stops your heart going to a bad rhythm. And it's anti-hypertensive, it protects you from heart problems. And in, in Europe, one of our recommendations is a healthy diet is recommended as a cornerstone of cardiovascular disease prevention. We certainly recommend that. Let's start with fat. Everyone thinks fat is really bad for you. And I know that many of you, for cultural or religious reasons, probably don't eat some of these things. But let's just talk about the whole thing in Europe. In you. you see at the top, red meat, poultry, cheese. At the bottom, dairy products. Let me just start by saying we need fat. We could not do without fat. Our brain needs fat, our central nervous system requires fat. Every cell in our body is made of a little bit of fat. Our hormones that keep us going are also made of fat. And the bone marrow in our bones is predominantly fat. So fat is not the enemy. We need it, but you need to make sure you're taking the right <coughs> fats. Here I'm showing you saturated fats. By saturated fats, I think give you a lesson on chemistry. But it means that if you see the lines between the two C's at the top, there's only a single line and not two double lines. These are saturated fats, and you find saturated fats in meat and dairy products, and we do need them in our body. We reckon in, 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 the Europe, in Europe that they should make up, fat should make up 30% of your diet, saturated fat should make up no more than 10% of your diet. But there are saturated fats in bad things as well, donuts, you know, fried stuff, jalebi, and all sorts of other things, which I'm going to come to in a moment. So some of the saturated fat salmon, if you're a vegetarian, not even a pescatarian, it's not the end of the world. We find them with nuts, vegetable oils, in certain vegetable and in certain fruits like avocados, <coughs> and these are supposed to be very good for us. I want to show you this. Again, I, I, I don't expect you to follow all of it. But there's a study that looks at saturated fats. These are the fats in dairy products. And trans-saturated fats. Trans-saturated uh, fats are bad. And this is the problem in India. The poor are, have, are eating all the wrong fats because industry makes oils so that they last long. They have a long, long shelf life. And they manipulate these fats in such a way, things like palm oil, for example, so that when you eat those fats, you really increase your risk of cardiovascular disease. Here, I'm just looking at saturated fats, okay? Just saturated fats. And to the, the left, you'll see, if, if the line goes that way, it's good. If the line goes the opposite way, it's bad. And you will see that almost all of it is in the middle somewhere almost all of it. There is no association between saturated fat and all-cause mortality or cardiovascular disease or diabetes or stroke. No trial has been able to show an association between saturated fats in dairy products, cheese, poultry and certain red meats and cardiovascular disease. It's important that you remember that today. 
Let's look at the story with trans fats. These are industrialized fats on our supermarket shelves anymore. Trans fats aren't all bad. Some of you who do eat red meat, red meat does contain trans fats, but those trans fats are not harmful. But in the UK, we tell you to keep your trans fat intake down to around 1% of your whole diet. So why have we not been able to demonstrate any relationship between saturated fat and all-cause mortality? That surprised you. Because if you decide today that you're going to adhere to a low-fat low diet, you're going to substitute with something else. Okay, well, I'm not eating any fat. I'm going to waste away if I don't start eating something else. So most people substitute their, fatty, their saturated fats with something else. And this... If you eat saturated fat, you increase your bad cholesterol. We do know that. Okay, bad cholesterol. LDL cholesterol is bad cholesterol. HDL cholesterol is good cholesterol. Triglycerides are bad. Now, if you cut down your saturated fat intake, you are likely to up your carbohydrate intake to give you energy. If you up your carbohydrate intake, you certainly drop your bad cholesterol. But your protective cholesterol, the HDL, goes down as well and your triglycerides go up. So you, you offset all the benefits that you had by cutting down your saturated fats. If you substitute that with monounsaturated fats, some dairy products and some poultry, your LDL doesn't change, your good cholesterol goes up, and your triglycerides go down. But if you saturated it with polyunsaturated fatty acids, such as vegetable oils, sunflower oil, peanut oil, avocados, walnuts, hazelnuts, you reduce your good cholesterol, uh, your bad cholesterol, you increase your good cholesterol, and you reduce your triglycerides. So what we tell you in Europe is that what we want you to do is replace your saturated fat with unsaturated fat and do not replace it with refined carbohydrates. That's what we're trying to tell you. So again, here is, at the top again, this is diet where you substituted 5% of your saturated fat at the top with trans fats, your risk goes up in the red. With unsaturated fat, you see in the green, risk going down, going down significant. With carbs, risk going up. With carbs from whole grains, risk going down. So when we talk about carbohydrates, there are different types of carbohydrates. And that's where us Indians really, really suffer. Carbohydrates are our Achilles heel, and they are our problem. Now, before you start worrying immensely, I want to give you an idea of what a good carbohydrate is and what a bad carbohydrate is. In the UK, we suggest that 50% of our diet is carbohydrate, so carbohydrate can't all be bad. But what is good carbohydrate? I'm, I'm going to skip this slide. These are the obvious bad carbohydrates, okay? So this is sugar. Refined carbohydrates equals sugar. Anything that actually contains sugar is a bad carbohydrate. I'm not saying Never, ever eat any of this ever again. I'm saying, oh yes, eat a tiny bit, but don't make a habit of hitting this very hard on a regular basis. This is the enemy for the Asian man. Let me tell you that. So what are not so obvious? These are also refined carbohydrates. They're modified starches. If you look here at the top, flour, white flour. We eat white flour frequently. Chapatis. This is our staple food. White rice, this is also staple for all of us. White bread. The Europeans eat pasta and spaghetti. And yet, we, th we are under the impression this is all good. This is not so bad as sugar, but it, this is not the best carbohydrate. So how do you eat the best carbohydrate? The best carbohydrate is carbohydrate where the shell of the grain has not been removed and where the grain has not been minced into a powder. That's good carbohydrate. So you can see corn, corn seeds, millet seeds, wheat, brown flour, brown rice. This is really good carbohydrate. 
And talking to this society here, where there is a ma massive Jain community, you guys do very well, okay? Because you eat legumes. You are very, you know, that's a very important aspect of your diet. You don't eat root foods like potatoes and carrots, but you rely very heavily on chickpeas, beans, black beans, white beans, lentils. These are very, very good sources of nutrition. So I would ask you all to eat as much dal as you want, as much peas, chickpeas, black peas, as much as you want. Tell whoever cooks for you, if you cook yourself, I would throw in olive oil and vegetable oils into your food, and I wouldn't cook them very, very heavily. We, as Indians, seem to destroy food the way we cook it. So I would eat some of it sort of not quite completely liquefied, if you see what I mean. Okay, so there are some good things. What about fruits? In India, and this surprised me, do you know, we tell you here that you should be taking five portions of vegetable or fruit per day. And what surprised me, that less than 1% of the Indian population actually achieved that. And it made me realize how privileged I am that when I go to India, I don't actually see proper India. I see, I, wherever I see, I see people selling fruit. So I thought fruit is in abundance in these places, but they hardly take that. And so we know that if you eat fruit, and this is data again, it shows you that if you eat four or five portions of fruit or vegetables, either, you reduce your cardiovascular risk by 38%. 38%, okay? And that's even after adjusting for age and smoking. There's an inverse relationship between fruit and vegetables and your cardiovascular risk. What about salt? Again, an enemy for the Indians. If you're like me, and you've managed to persuade anyone who cooks for you, because I'm not a great cook, to cut their salt intake down, just try it. Try cutting your salt intake down for a month. Then go to an Indian person's house for lunch or dinner or go to an Indian restaurant, you will not be able to eat it. For those of you that don't take any sugar in your coffee, it's the same as someone putting in three sugars in your coffee and say, here you go. That's how bad it will taste. We don't actually need a lot of salt in our diet. We know that salt increases blood pressure. We know that salt causes high blood pressure. We know that high blood pressure causes strokes. But if you actually look at decent studies with salt, most studies have shown that salt reduction increases your, decreases your blood pressure by about four millimeters of mercury. There is weak evidence only that it reduces cardiovascular events and it only does so in high, people with high blood pressure. So if you've got high blood pressure, you should be keeping your salt intake down. I'm going to finish off with the Mediterranean diet and see how the Indian diet can compare with the Mediterranean diet. The Mediterranean diet is supposed to be the best diet around in the world and is associated with the lowest cardiovascular mortality. The Mediterranean people rely heavily on fruits, nuts, olive oil, and oily fish. They eat much less red meat than the rest of the Europeans, but that probably doesn't apply to many of you. If you do a study with, Medi with, 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 with um, the Mediterranean diet, these guys studied Mediterranean diet, they told these guys, some of them, a third of them, to cut down their fat. So stay on whatever you've got in the Mediterranean diet, but cut down your fat. They told a third of them, we're going to carry on making you take your Mediterranean diet, but we're going to make you have five tablespoons of olive oil every day. Five tablespoons. So when I tell you you need to eat olive oil, I don't mean a dash. I mean scoops of it, okay? And they told a third of them, we're not going to give you the extra olive oil. We're going to give you 30 grams of walnuts, hazelnuts, something that you can keep on your desk. Pistachios, almonds. Okay, not fried, not salty. And they found, in these people who were aged about 67, all of them had problems. 50% had diabetes, 80% had high blood pressure, 70% had high cholesterol. So these are high-risk people, and they put them on this diet for nine years. And what they found, compared to controls, that people who adhere to this olive oil diet and this nuts diet reduce their risk of cardiovascular disease by 
and this was primarily driven by reducing stroke. Okay? So I'm going to end with this final slide, and this is the take-home message for all of you. We, saturated fats, we need them. We want them to be less than 10% of your diet. If you decide to cut out your fat, replace it by unsaturated fats. So if you decide to go on a diet today and say, I'm not going to eat anything fat, that's not a good idea. You will eat fat, you just won't eat saturated fats and trans fats, you eat unsaturated fat. Trans fats are an enemy in India, we need to do something about that. You reduce your salt intake to 5 grams per day. Carbohydrates, you eat whole grain products, okay? Fruits and vegetables between three servings of each per, per, per day. If you like fish, fish is really good for you, oily fish, not any old fish, Col uh, salmon, mackerel. For those of you that say, ah, I don't like fish, but I'll eat cod liver oil tablets, cod liver oil tablets do nothing for your health. They do only something for your psyche that you're doing something. They actually have no impact on your health. Unsalted nuts, 30 grams per day. I didn't talk about alcohol today because I've run out of time. But alcohol, two units per day for men, one unit for women. Cut down your sugary drinks, your sugary foods. So in conclusion, physical activity is good. Lifestyle modification is an important cornerstone for preventing cardiovascular disease in people at moderate to low risk. Exercising at least 150 minutes per week. Walking, like climbing stairs is good, but if you did even more, that's better. And I think it's telling me to stop. I've already given you the dietary measures. Thank you very much for your attention. I think Professor Sharma, what you've told us that we all are not supposed to eat jalebis tomorrow morning in breakfast now. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. I request Sri Ganpat Bhai Chaudhary to please come and felicitate uh, Professor Sanjay Sharma, please. Professor? Sorry, while we request this, Deputy Mayor is up here. We have to respect this time. Yes, we were pressed. We appreciate it. One on one is better. I can do 10 times. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm really honoured and it's an honour to actually come here and speak to non-medics uh, about something that you do. It, 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 it's, it's, been, it's been a real pleasure and I was really honoured when Mehul asked me to do this. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. I invite Professor Dr. Sanjay Sharma because people are very keen on few questions. So let's, yes. Can we have questions? So I wanted some comments on that. Uh, how do you benefit more? Will you get your heart rate more than 100% of your capacity for your age group? Second question was on the, in the corporate America, we see quite a bit now people moving from the sitting offices to standing offices. It's highly recommended that you don't sit in one place for more than an hour. A lot of people in our community, they have a sitting job, they sit for extended time, period of time. So comment on that, how we can work on those two. Thank you. Pleasure. Um, good points. Uh, the first point is uh, the intensity and the amount of exercise that you should be performing. Um, you are right to say that people who perform very intensive exercise get benefits, more benefits, in the time they perform that exercise. So if you're doing very intensive exercise, as I said earlier, you only have to do half the time of exercise versus if you're doing sort of more gra graded aerobic exercise. Now, that's not to say that it, it graded aerobic exercise is bad. It's, it tells us that you can do 25 minutes of very intensive exercise, high interval training that you're talking about, three times per week, which equates to 30 minutes of graded exercise, of gradual exercise, five times per week. That's the benefit. So that's what, that's what the equations are, okay? Um, Clearly, some of you, not all of you in the audience, are of the age uh, and may have risk factors and it may even be sitting on coronary artery disease that you know nothing about. So I am not going to encourage some of you to go out there and push your heart to the limit uh, if you don't know what is going on inside. Um, the second point about standing, 
Standing is good. We know that, we, and there are many offices, as you rightly point out, that have workstations where people stand for quite a while. I should have actually made that point, um, that uh, if you can stand, even when you're at work, stand and work if you can. I mean, my job is like that. I'm a doctor. I have to walk all the time, and I'm a cardiologist, so we're very A to B. And, um, but um, you should try to stand if it's a very desk job. Sta stand and work. Some of you can do that, I'm sure. Um, I, one thing I should have also told all of you, I didn't talk about fluids, and Mehul pointed out very rightly that I should give you good advice on fluid. You should drink at least two litres of fluid a day. Now, by fluid, I don't mean orange juice or passion fruit juice. I mean water, okay? Yeah. Good One more question. Yes. Doctor, uh, very great presentation, at least. Uh, I think for me it was a great insight. But uh, I have a question. I've been reading about this for the last uh, six months. There was a report uh, dated September 12, 2016 in New York Times. Not sure if you're aware of that. Which extensively said about a report by the Trade, or Trade uh, Association of Sugar Federation of US. In 1960, there were three Harvard professors who had given a report on why saturated fat is the cause of heart disease. That report, it says there are documents to prove that they were paid $50,000 to show that sugar is not the cause, but fat is the cost, cause. Uh, I've been interacting with a lot of, lot of cardiologists last uh, 12 months, uh, yes. very senior ones in Chennai and all over India, and been discussing about this, and uh, they've started to believe that it's not fat, but it's sugar, which could be the major cause of heart disease. What's your thought about that, please? Uh, so, just to summarize, what, what I've been asked is, historically, fat has been the enemy. That's been the historical enemy, and as you rightly say, the medical fraternity have led you all to believe that if you eat fat, your cholesterol levels and everything goes up, and you clog up your arteries, and you drop dead. Clearly, things have changed. Uh, we, I would agree that the, the, the thought process has changed. That, and I showed you, that's why I deliberately showed you evidence, that there are no studies, if you look at proper meta-analysis, that have actually linked intake of saturated fatty acids and cardiovascular disease or cardiovascular death. What's happening, and that's what we believe now, is that people who cut back fats substitute the calorific intake by something else. And if you substitute your calories from reducing fat by carbohydrates, by that I mean refined carbohydrates, the obvious being sugar, or refined starches, the obvious being white rice, white flour chapatis, then that is worse than, not, than eating fat. If you're going to eat fat, there is, there is, there is, we need fat. I would suggest that you substitute saturated fat, that is fat in dairy products and cheese and cream and meats. You substitute that with plant type of oils and fats, such as olive oil and nut oils and avocados and various other things. Has that answered your question? Sort of? Yeah, so the thought process. Potatoes are the least effective. We'll have a flurry of emails and messages. Everybody trying to sort out how to increase lifespan.